Right, here is another of my favourite places to come and read. On a warm afternoon it's especially pleasurable to come here when you've just got the sea down behind Davar and you're completely private here, you can sit shaded by these trees because it's been extremely hot today um, and uh, simply enjoy a good book. Now, I was very recently sent, I mean like within the last 10 days I think, a copy of an amazing new book from Oxford University Press called The Lockhart Plot, subtitled Love, Betrayal, Assassination and Counter-Revolution in Lenin's Russia. And this is written by Jonathan Schneer, who is not a scholar of Russia and um, has been interested in the Lockhart case for a long time, but for essentially personal reasons, as he explains in the introduction, he's a retired lecturer at Georgia Tech, which is a very well thought of university in the United States. Uh, in retirement, he has taken up this uh, project to study one of the great mysteries, and it is a mystery. I've read a lot about Bruce Lockhart listen to a lot of what has been said about him and about the alleged Lockhart plot. Lockhart is a very, very interesting man. He announces himself in his most famous book, uh, Memoirs of a British Agent, and says he has not a single drop of English blood in his veins. And sometimes he discusses Russia in terms which refer to his Scottish um, situation, identity, I think that would be the word now. But the main reason why I got interested in Bruce Lockhart is because he wrote what is, in my opinion, the best ever single book about Russia. It's the most insightful, it's the most poetic, it's the most evocative, it's the most... Um, accurate as to the mood of Russia, and hardly a word in it you can absolutely definitely believe, uh, or at least hardly a word of the, the, more, um, uh, the more sensitive parts. And the sensitive parts of course concern his activities as a British agent. In early 1918, after the Bolsheviks had taken over, we'll come on to that, now, I just want to set the scene a little by very, very briefly outlining his life. He went to Fetty's, uh, I think did rather badly in his exams, but extremely well in sport. Uh, then went and went out to Malaysia, became an apprentice rubber planter and a whole lot of things. He decided not to go to university like his, unlike his brother and eventually decided he had a proper job took the civil service exam, crammed like mad, and passed out top. He was a clever guy, but like many clever people, he thought university was a waste of time. And in January 1912, he arrived in Moscow, having been appointed, uh, I don't know, assistant to the consul or something in Moscow. The ambassador, of course, Sir George Buchanan, another Scotsman, um, was in Petersburg. Being a, a good writer, he passes over all the tedious boss uh, stuff and gives a long description, of which I'm going to read a short part, of what happened to him almost immediately after he arrived in Moscow. And the interest of this is in a couple of things. The first one simply is it is a description of Russia, the colourful Russia that used to be before the Bolsheviks and bureaucracy took over. And this reflects um, a theme of my previous review, which was about Central Asia. And my point I was trying to make there was that Central Asia was so colourful and fascinating and exotic and everything until the curse of, curse of bureaucracy fell over it, courtesy of the Bolsheviks. He stresses, and I agree with him, that there is some kind of congruence between the Scottish, as it were, slightly Highland character, that has rule of law implications, but we'll probably come back to those another time, but not now, and the Russians, who have never really developed a rule of law approach to life. 
in public affairs. The scene is this. He arrived in Moscow in January 1912. It was, everything was serene in life and the snow was on the ground and he was totally new to this world. And within three days, he was invited to a vast party at the vast house of the owner of a vast sugar estate uh, or set of sugar estates and indeed a vast sugar refining business in the Ukraine, the Haritonenkos. And this is a very famous building now because it was taken over at the time of the revolution like anything like that obviously and became the British embassy for a long time. It is now the British ambassador's residence. Britain built a new embassy in the uh, late 1980s, I think. Uh, I used to go and play squash there, but used to be invited to many parties of various sorts at the British ambassador's residence, which is an absolutely fantastic thing, uh, decked out in pseudo-Gothic oak panelling and all that kind of thing. The Haritoninkos employed an architect who was going to mimic the British country house style. They produced this absolutely amazing house at which this party took place. So we have a, a rather um, gauche novice diplomat um, arriving at this huge party which has been held in order of a British parliamentary and military delegation which had come to Russia in order to coordinate uh, defence arrangements. Bruce Lockhart writes as follows. The Haritonikas house was an immense palace on the far side of the river, just opposite the Kremlin. To meet the British delegates, every official, every notable, every millionaire in Moscow had been invited. And when I arrived, I found a throng like a theatre queue struggling on the staircases. The whole house was a fairyland of flowers brought all the way from Nice. Orchestras seemed to be playing in every antechamber. When I finally made my way upstairs, I was lost in a crowd in which I knew no one. I doubt if I even shook hands with my host and hostess, but at long narrow tables vodka and the most delicious zakuski, both hot and cold, were being served by scores of waiters to the standing guests. I took a glass of vodka and tried several of the unknown dishes. They were excellent. Then an English-speaking Russian took pity on my loneliness and I had more vodka and more zakuski. It was long past the appointed hour for dinner, but no one seemed to be moving. And presently it struck me that perhaps in this strange country, people dined standing up. I had another vodka and a second portion of the reindeer tongue. Then, when my appetite was sated, a footman came along and handed me a card with a plan of the table and my own particular place. And a few minutes later, a huge procession made its way to the dining room. I do not wish to exaggerate. I say truthfully that I cannot remember the number of courses or the different varieties of wine which accompanied them, but the meal lasted till eleven o'clock and would have taxed the intestines of a giant. My immediate neighbours were a Miss von Meck, the daughter of a railway magnate, and Commander Kachowski, the Russian flag lieutenant who had been attached to Lord Charles Beresford, who I think was leading the delegation from memory. Miss von Meck spoke excellent English. It'll be remembered that it was Galina von Meck, another member of that family that was the uh, patron, patroness of Tchaikovsky. Miss von Meck spoke excellent English. Under the warm glow of unaffected volubility, my shyness soon melted. Before the meal was halfway through, she had given me a lightning survey, and this is what I like. I'm build, this is all building up to this particular bit, because this is Russia, or well, this is Russian people of a certain sort. Before the meal was halfway through, she had given me a lightning survey of Anglo-Russian relations, a summary of the English and Russian characters, a thumbnail sketch of everyone in the room, and a detailed account of all her own realised and unrealised ambitions and desires. And so he goes on. What the evening must have cost, there's a, I've missed out a bit here, that um, at the suicide of one of the Russian officers at the uh, 
who, who, who the guy who was sitting next to him, Count Karhovsky, went and committed suicide that evening by shooting himself in the telephone box outside because his lover had jilted him. So a bit of drama as well, but that's I'll leave that out. What the evening must have cost, I do not know. For me, it was not to finish until the early morning. After the musical entertainment, we danced. As far as I was concerned, it was not a successful experiment. Clinging firmly to the friendly Von Meck girl, I repaired once more to the dining room, where a continuous supper was in progress. Here I met my host's son, a young, chubby-faced boy who was still in his teens, and who even at that age showed signs of the corpulence of good living. With flushed cheeks, he informed us that after the guests had gone, we were going to hear the gypsies. We formed a minor conspiracy, collected half a dozen kindred spirits, and at four in the morning we set out in troikas, private troikas, drawn by magnificent Arabs, on the long drive to Strelna, the kingdom of Maria Nikolaevna. I can still visualise those troikas standing before the house, the fur rugs, the drivers with their tiny fur-capped heads protruding from immense folds of their shubas, for all the world like gargantuan gollywogs, the beautiful horses straining at their bits, below us the ice-bound river lit up like a silver thread by the moon, and immediately before us the ghostly towers of the Kremlin, standing out like white sentinels before the starry camp of night. It's well worth remembering that the Kremlin in those days painted white. It's now just brick colour, but in those days it was painted white. We took our place, two to each troika. The drivers purred to their horses, and in a second we were off. For four glorious miles we tore at breakneck speed through the deserted streets, up the Tverskaya, past the Brest station, that's the Bieloruski Voxel nowadays, past the famous ninth establishment of Yar, where he later on saw... Um, Rasputin disgrace himself, and indeed the royal family who protected him, out into Petrovsky Park, until with stinging cheeks and icicles on the driver's beards we drew up before the miniature crystal palace which is Strelna. As in a dream I followed the others through the palm court, which is the main part of the building, into a large pine-walled cabinet with a roaring wood fire burning in an open fireplace. The proprietor rubbed his hands and bowed. The head waiter bowed without rubbing his hands. A host of waiters in white uniforms bowed still lower and moved silently to their various tasks. In a few seconds the room was prepared for the great ritual. We sat at a large table near the fire. Before us was an open space and behind it a semicircle of chairs for the gypsies. The wine waiter brought the champagne, and then Maria Nikolaevna came in followed by eight gypsies, four men with guitars and four girls with eyes like slows and sinuous graceful bodies. Both men and women were dressed in the traditional gypsy costume, the men with white brocaded Russian shirts and coloured trousers, the girls in coloured silks with red silk handkerchief around their heads. And I could go on, but I will not, because it is the yeah, it's the best book about Russia ever written, in my humble opinion. Bruce Lockhart fell in love with Russia. He had absolutely um, amazing linguistic skills, and very soon he was speaking Russian completely fluently, apparently without any accent at all, according to various people quoted in this book, um, and was ended up actually interpreting for Trotsky during the course of the revolution. He was that uh, skilled at it. Trotsky trusted him to render his his Russian into English um, and diplomatic for diplomatic purposes just after the revolution. So that's that's a pretty high accolade, I would have thought. There are two aspects to this book one of which I am not going to discuss particularly because it's, if you like, the plot of the book, and I don't want to ruin Professor Schneer's story. In other words, what exactly happened to Bruce Lockhart and the Lockhart plot? There's an element of whodunit in this, and I don't want to just tell you who done it. What I would like to just mention, and it's part of the whole Russian issue, this really, is that Bruce Lockhart eventually met the, the love of his life, and he was, and he was the love of her life, 
and tragedy ensued, although it was largely his fault because of being careless. Anyway, he was the consul there um, in Moscow, and in the summer of 1917 he was withdrawn, and then when, it, when the revolution happened shortly after that, he was, had made quite an impression on Lord Milner, and Lord Milner and Lloyd George decided that he should be the man to go back to Russia and open some kind of line of communication with the Bolsheviks. We're now talking January 1918. The Bolsheviks are negotiating with the Germans for what was eventually to become the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, and uh, Lockhart went to Petersburg, where he met all, or Petrograd as it then was, where he met all the uh, all the other um, people, there was a French chargé d'affaires there, there was an American guy who was a Red Cross um, officer of very idealistic semi-Quaker, I think he was a Quaker, Quakerish type of tendencies, a guy called Raymond Robbins, interesting bloke. And they all tried to interpret Bolshevik policy to their governments, which was extremely difficult because nobody knew what was going on. And in addition to that, there were a whole lot of other interesting people there. One of the most interesting was Arthur Ransom. He was reporting for the Manchester Guardian, and he was a full-scale Bolshevik sympathiser, and ended up marrying Trotsky's secretary, Elena, Elena Shilyapina, I think her name was, from memory. And there was another guy called Captain Francis Kremi, who was a really interesting character who did his level best to actually scuttle the Russian fleet in Kronstadt harbour, um, not far from Petrograd, when the um, it looked as if the Bolshevik regime might do a deal with the Germans. Of course, we still don't forget in the war here. It didn't end until November 1918. Here we're talking of January 1918. And of course, there's Sidney Riley, the man on whom Ian Fleming is said to have based James Bond, who was one of the most bizarre characters. Um, and of course on the other side you had a whole load of people working from Dzerzhinsky down, downwards, and there's a fair bit of information here about Dzerzhinsky. Felix, Iron Felix he was known as, and he was he had been so brutally treated in the Tsarist prisons that he, he was a, quite clearly mad. And Dzerzhinsky's uh, second-in-command also features quite a lot in this book and an awful lot in Bruce Lockhart's book, Yakov Peters. He was a Latvian who had lived many years in England and had a girlfriend or wife, it's not quite clear what her status was, but he had uh, some kind of uh, amorous connection in England where he had spent, as I say, quite a few years before the war. He confessed to Bruce Lockhart that he suffered physical pain any time he, every time he signed a, an execution warrant. And apparently, according to this guy, Stalin read Bruce Lockhart's book when it was published in 1932 or 3, something like that, and uh, thought, we can't have people in the, in the Cheka, well it was the NKVD by then, who um, are worried about signing death warrants, that's no use, and uh, Peters was accused on a, I think, almost certainly trumped up charge of being a Latvian nationalist all along and was shot. There's Spiridonova, the uh, weird Ukrainian uh, SR, social revolutionary. Savinkov, one of the most extraordinary people. Again, a bit of a walk-on part here. Litvinov, who the British government took hostage the British government acted very decisively when they're, unlike today, when their uh, man was taken hostage in, in Moscow, they simply took the, the Bolshevik person and about half a dozen others hostage in London. And of course there's Fanny Kaplan, the weirdo who shot Lenin and uh, effectively triggered the Red Terror at the end of August 1918. So it's a cast of thousands, and a very, very interesting account of this whole event. Now, what was the event? The event, in very brief summary, was an attempt to use Russian forces to rise up against the Bolsheviks 
in the middle of 1918. And the interesting thing about this, which is a point that Schneer uh, makes prominently and well, is the extent to which a lot of the people who became prominent anti-Bolshevists, with the exception of people like Sidney Riley, but most of them started off, and Bruce Lockhart was a, an extremely strong case in point, most of them started off as potential, if not actual, Bolshevik sympathisers. Arthur Ransom was a total sympathiser, um, and Bruce Lockhart was somebody who had a terrific feel for the sort of Russian, whole Russian world. He was disposed to give the Bolsheviks a chance, because one thing that comes out in this book, to a certain extent, and is very strongly dealt with in the next book I'm going to cover, called Bankers and Bolsheviks, is the extent to which there was a fantastic international and local in Russia sigh of relief when the Tsar was deposed. The whole regime in Russia was so unpopular and so inefficient and so corrupt and it ended up having no defenders. And a lot of people like Bruce Lockhart just thought, well, the Bolsheviks can't be any worse than this and they represent the Russian people, let's give them a chance. And the interesting thing that is emphasised in this book here too is the extent to which that position changed very quickly because the Bolsheviks were thugs. I'm not going to steal Professor Schneer's thunder by giving the whole story, but the bottom line is that they, with the aid of some bogus Latvians, they tried to, they tried to overthrow the Bolshevik regime in the summer of 1918 and com by complete coincidence, round about the time that Lenin was shot by Fanny Kaplan and the powers that be took put two and two together and uh, assumed the whole thing was what part of one big plot. It was, it was at the same time as well as the German ambassador, Count Milbach, was murdered in Moscow by some SRs, the Spiridonova people. And, um, you know, bottom line was it was complete chaos. The Bolshevik regime wasn't very well established. They could possibly have succeeded. I'm sure the world, and certainly the Russian nation, would largely speaking have been grateful for them subsequently if they had, but you know, that's speculation. But anyway, the point is that these people changed, and the, he gives an account of several of these people, with the exception of Arthur Ransom, really, I think, and Raymond Robbins, the American Quaker, um, who incidentally was later responsible for Franklin Roosevelt uh, recognizing the Soviet Union, opening trade and all those sort of contacts in 1933. But the main fact is that as soon as the Bolsheviks showed their true character, everybody was revolted by them. Nobody wanted to deal with them, nobody would sympathize with them, and they were just brutes and thugs. However, in terms of themes of the rule of law, I think it's worth pointing out a couple of things about their, the Bolshevik attitude, and this is what people came to realise was the reality behind this new regime, and was why they ceased to support it. And Dzerzhinsky pretty well embodied the problem in his own attitude. And I'm just going to here on page 236 quote a little bit of Dzerzhinsky, because it's, this is extremely important from a rule of law point of view. Four months ago, a determined, ruthless Felix Dzerzhinsky had said of the Cheka, his uh, creation, that's the, the very first manifestation of secret police that the Bolsheviks came up with, um, was eventually replaced by the OGPU, the GPU, then the OGPU, then the NKVD, then the KGB, and now we've got the FSB. Dzerzhinsky said of the Cheka, his creation instrument, we represent in ourselves organised terror. We are terrorizing the enemies of Soviet power in order to strangle crimes in their germ. Now, what he means is we're going to have preventative executions, effectively. They're going to shoot people because they might commit a crime. Now, I don't know about you, but there's many crimes I might commit, and if every single person in Scotland was shot because they might commit a crime, we'd be living in a pretty empty country. And it was the same in Russia. Of course, they were selective, and we'll come to that. Discriminate terror must be supplemented by terror that was indiscriminate. Only that could save a revolution, menaced as Russia's was. 
The man who lived to serve others, who dreamt of making in Russia an earthly paradise, that's Dzerzhinsky, it's described at the beginning. He became a Bolshevik in order to create paradise, and he ended up drowning in blood. The man who dreamt of making Russia an earthly paradise, and who saw himself as a soldier engaged in a fight to the death to create it, would help to open the floodgates and let loose a sea of blood. Now, we'll recall Winston Churchill said of Lenin, his aim to improve the world, his method to blow it up. And one of Dzerzhinsky's assistants, a Latvian, as so many of them were, the Praetorian Guard of the Revolution right at the beginning, a guy called Martin Latsis, a senior Czechist, instructed his agents not to quote, look in the file of incriminating evidence to see whether or not the accused rose up against the Soviets with arms or words. Ask him instead to which class he belongs. What is his background, his education, his profession? These are the questions that will determine the fate of the accused. End of quote. Schneer goes on to say, this approach would culminate only weeks later in Grigory Zinoviev's chilling pronouncement. Quote, we must carry along with us 90 million out of the 100 million of Soviet Russia's population. As for the rest, they must be annihilated. Now, I'd just like to say one thing about that in connection with the uh, review number 56 about SNP leaders, Scottish National Party leaders. And in that, um, it will be recalled that somebody called Mandy Rhodes, uh, who wrote the essay on Nicola Sturgeon, described Sturgeon as an authentic Scot because of her allegedly lower class background, her state education, uh, her left wing, left leaning attitudes and so on. And it doesn't really matter what the criteria are. The fact is that she is authentically Scots. Now, an authentic Russian, in this, in, in Zinoviev's um, thing, is somebody who agrees with the Soviet government. And there's 10 million people who not only uh, are not authentic Russians, but they don't have the right to life. And going from Zinoviev's proposal for mass murder through to Bandy Rhodes's um, attempt to create sectarian division in Scotland along nationalist political lines, there is a, a huge uh, gap. I'm not suggesting the SNP wanted to kill people. It, I think the roots of that kind of thinking on both ends of that spectrum of violence are pretty well the same. You are a, you are a, a, a citizen of a country depending on your attitude. If you're authentic, i.e. you agree with the government, you are allowed to enjoy in Scotland full civil and political rights and in uh, Soviet Russia enjoy continuing to live. Now the entire point of the rule of law is that you can actually have a different attitude and different set of uh, values and views from the government but you're still looked after as part of the country because we can agree to disagree. I'm afraid every time I hear people in Scotland talking that exclusionary, hoas us anti-rule of law, sectarian tone, I hear distant echoes of Zinoviev, Martin Latsis, Felix Iron, Felix Dzerzhinsky, etc, etc, etc. And I think it is worth thinking about this kind of um, perverted idealism in those terms. I'm going to end by just saying something, quoting something Felix Dzerzhinsky himself said. He got ill, went to Switzerland, capitalist place, to have, his, uh, to have a cure, and came back in um, 1919. Schneer says, in fact, only months after returning from his wife and son to Russia from his cure in Switzerland, and I like to know why Czerzynski did not have his wife and son with him in Russia. That would probably answer quite a lot of questions. He sent instructions to subordinates in the Cheka throughout the country. They said in part, one, make out a list of the entire population from which hostages can be taken. 
namely former landowners, merchants, factory owners, industrialists, industrialists, bankers, large real estate owners, officers of the old army, important officials of the Tsarist and Kerensky regimes, and relatives of persons who are fighting against us. 2. Send in these lists. He reserved this Schneer comments. He reserved to himself and other top Chekhar officials the right to choose who would live and who would die. And that is Sovietism in a nutshell. So there we are. It's an interesting book. It's called The Lockhart Plot and I highly recommend it. It's not um, disfigured as so many of the other books I have by, by Computer Generated Index, so well done Oxford University Press. And uh, it has a couple of mistakes that I, you know, but he's not a Russian specialist. I don't really think they're that important. I mean, for example, he says somewhere that uh, Karl Radek, who was a very, very interesting guy, who was a friend of Lockhart's, um, was shot after the 1938 trial. In fact, in 1937 trial, he was given 10 years in prison in the Gulag and he was beaten to death by one of the other Gulag prisoners. He died as a result of a fight, not uh, a bullet in the back of the head. And there's too much for my liking of, you know, it, it, he must have thought that. His, his, uh, his attitude clearly was, or, you know, sort of, in other words, there's too much assumption. But that's a small point. It's a great book, very interesting, and most importantly, it is an absolutely fascinating subject. And I'm not going to tell you what the result was. Was there a Lockhart plot or was there not? And if so, was it really attempting to do what has often been denied, and that is actually uh, bring about regime change very early on, um, as Churchill wanted, to strangle Bolshevism's cradle, Bolshevism in its cradle. So I'll leave that to the curious reader to, uh, to learn when they finally read this uh, excellent book. So there we are. It's a beautiful afternoon. Clouds have come over a little bit now, but uh, still it's nice and sunny elsewhere.